morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as I'm beginning, I want to acknowledge something. I went by the mailbox. I'm the one who picks up the mail for us. We have a post office box. And um, I wanted just to acknowledge those people who are watching online who are sending checks in. It's really kind of cool. It's always a, a surprise. And um, it's happening with greater and greater frequency later. And that's really nice. Um, those of you who know Marty and I don't get paid for this. We just do this because we want to create the spiritual experience we always wanted. You know, um, I always think of, um, and I'm sure nobody else can relate, but um, the band Kiss, which I was a huge fan, still <laughs> 10 am, and I get to be, I don't care. Um, they basically, when they came along in the 70s, they couldn't get played on radio, they couldn't get anything, but what they decided was they were going to create concerts, which were the coolest concerts they'd ever seen, because they wanted to blow themselves away, and as a result, they sold more, Beatle, more, more albums, except the Beatles have only, the only band that sold more albums than Kiss, and yet they've never had radio play. So, this is our opportunity to do what we want to do on Sundays. And I'm glad you're here, because it'd be kind of funny if I was sitting here talking to an empty room. So, uh, <laughs> I've done that before, too, actually. Um, yeah, we had a snowstorm one time, and we had one person show up, and we did the entire church service. It was so much fun. Do you remember that, Alex? Yeah, yeah that was a lot of fun. It was Rick. I still remember who showed up. It was Rick Silvey. Anyway, I... We've been talking about Edwin Gaines' Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity, and that's why I wanted to bring up the concept of tithing, because what I'm seeing now is that our audience of people who are not only here, but outside of here, are beginning to step into tithing. I always want to tell you I don't get paid because I don't want you to think I'm getting your money. Your tithing and what goes here goes to help pay the bills here. It pays for the rent and everything like that. But we need to develop this idea of giving. If we want, and we all want, okay, we have to admit we all want. There are things we want. You woke up this morning wanting things. And to get them, you need to give. Because it's just the way God designed it. The Iroquois Indians called it the, the beneficent desire of the soul. Let me say that again. The beneficent desire of the soul. You were born with a desire to give. When you wake up wanting and you don't give, you block off the flow of the universe and it stops flowing to you. So we've talked about Edwin's book. I want to talk about something um, tying into that and that is discipline. I want to talk about the concept of discipline because raise your hand if you've ever struggled with discipline. Please raise your hand. Look around the room. Look around the room. That's called social proof. We all do. We all do. And it's amazing to me, Edwin, Edwin Gaines, let me see what he put up there. Oh, I love that. Now, is that not good? Rick always does cool images. <laughs> is that not discipline? I just tell Rick Stone who, what I'm going to talk about, and he puts up the coolest images. That's absolutely perfect. Because every one of us has wanted to be that dog going and chasing the cat. Even though we know we're not supposed to do it, we think we are. And what I want to share with you is that this is not a you struggle. This is a human struggle. This has gone, gone on not only around the world, but it's gone on through time. And I want to prove the point this morning using the Bible. Um, when I was in college, I took Shakespeare because somebody told me it was an easy class. <laughs> <coughs> And what happened was, exactly, and what happened was I had a teacher who so loved Shakespeare that it just excited me about Shakespeare and it became easy because I wanted to read Shakespeare all of a sudden. My greatest goal is to do that with you with the Bible. Whenever I talk about the Bible, which isn't a lot, you can tell I have a lot of passion for it. I was inspired to speak to you about discipline because people come up to me all the time and they say, oh, I wish I had this. I wish I could do this. I wish I could be this. And I think there's literally nothing stopping you except your belief that you can't do it. It is so true. And so what we do is we then hang around with other people who agree with that point of view. Don't you realize nobody in our family has ever done such and such? Who are you to consider being such and such? Why do you think you're... And then the real question is, what makes you so darn special? God? 
And I've decided to be special, and I've decided to try things, and I've decided to be things. But unfortunately, I make the decision, I get so excited, and then I can't seem to get myself to do it. We all have that. The Apostle Paul never met Jesus Christ. Paul was a Jew who was actually a Roman citizen, and he played them both very, very well, and I mean that sincerely in a very good way. We would not have Christianity without Paul. Some would say we would not have Christianity without Jesus. Well, that's obvious. But we definitely would not have Christianity without Paul because Paul went around and started all the churches. And so what he did, he was a tent maker, and he went from city to city, and he would found these churches in Rome. He founded them in Corinth. He founded them in Philippi. He founded them all over the area, working as a tent maker. He would get the church up and going, and then he'd say, okay, bye, I'm going off, and he would go off to start another one. And guess what the churches would do? What do churches do? He said this. No, he said this. Well, he meant this. Well, we should do this. And they would write Paul, and then they would go, Paul, he's not doing what you say he's supposed to do. And that's why Paul wrote his letters. That's all they are, is responses to whiny church people. But they're pretty good responses. Because in them, Paul writes that love is patient, love is kind. It is not self-serving. It does not demand its own way. It is not boastful. Paul wrote some beautiful stuff. But what was cool about Paul was he was honest about what a mess up he was. And I want to share that with you. This is from Romans 7. And I'm going to cover the the whole chapter. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those of you who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime. What does he mean when he says the law? He means the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. That was their whole law. That was their Bible. The, the, the Old Testament was not even put together until 42 years after the death of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament. So when he says the law, he is talking about the Judaic law, which believed to have been written by Moses, even though Moses would have written about his own death, which would have been kind of cool, but not possible. The first five books of the Bible. So this is what he's talking about, that it only matters that the law, the Jewish law only matters when you're alive. And he gives an example. Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Notice that only women can be adulteresses. There was no adulterer. There was no word for adulterer. There was only adulteress. In the same way, my friends, you have died to the law, the old teachings, through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that you may bear fruit for God. While we are living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. He makes a really interesting point. His point is, he goes on to say, that I didn't even know I was a sinner until someone told me I was. He goes on to say that until I read all of these laws that I wasn't supposed to do, I thought I was a pretty good person. And what I've discovered is that the more laws there are and the more I'm told that I break them, the easier it is to break them and the harder it is to be a good person. I hope there's some parents watching right now (laughs) or listening right now. The more laws, the more you say, don't do this, don't do this, instead of you're wonderful, you're sweet, and I love you, and you're great, they want to live up to that. But when you say, this is the law, and you're failing, then people actually tend to fail more and not live up to it.
What then should we say, he says, the law is sin by no means. In other words, he's saying, does the law then make you think these bad things because you then know the law? It's a good law, he says. I would not have known what it is to covet, though, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Paul is very honest. He's like, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And now that I realize I'm not supposed to want, I want more. Can you relate to this? The word sin has been thrown around as this blood stain that we all have on us, and it has never been true. It is not true. It's not what it means. The word sin is a Greek term. It means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. You aim for the red. You hit the blue or the yellow. You did what? What's the word? What does it mean? Mr. the mark. Does it mean you're stained and soiled and bad forever? Yes or no? Does it mean God can't stand you? He's mad at me. No, no, of course not. It means you missed the mark. But the thing is, if you're standing there and you're shooting and you, and you accidentally are a little on the edge of the red, but you still hit the red and somebody goes, be careful, you almost hit the blue. What are you more likely to hit the next time? What do we say to ourselves constantly? When we're trying to make a change in our lives, we talk about how we messed up instead of how well we've done. People talk about alcoholics who have gone 20 years of sobriety and then they fall off the wagon. See, it failed. They had 20 years. Are you kidding me? Failed nothing. We need to celebrate the good and then it makes it easier for us to do the good. Paul goes on to say, that when he turns himself over to these sinful thoughts, okay? I want to give you a context for the word sin. In this word, in this way he's using it, it's exactly the way we use the word ego. Ego. Not in the Freudian sense, the id, ego, superego. I'm talking in the metaphysical, spiritual sense in that we all have an onboard computer virus <laughs> in our heads. <laughs> And it's constantly telling us that we're no good, we're the problem, we'll never accomplish anything. And then when we argue with it and say, you know what, yes, we are good, yes, we can, yes, we will, then it goes, as a matter of fact, you're right. They're no good, they'll never accomplish anything, they'll never amount to anything. We all have this. We all have this and it never, ever goes away. It is our sacred cloud. It is there to bless us by poking us constantly. And it's always there. And so Paul says, boom, we need to figure this out. I think it might be because my leg is crossed, but I'm just going to keep talking. So I said, now I can't find the microphone. It's these fancy Lululemon pants, <laughs> which I do love. Thank you very much. Please tell Lululemon, send me more pants. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Paul says that when he gets into this sinful nature that he literally disappears and what he can't understand is he gets really, really excited about stuff, but then he doesn't do it. He says, this is in uh, 715, for I do not do what I want. That means the things he knows he should but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I want to do, now if I do what I want, I agree that the law is good. In other words, it works. It gets me to do what I want, to do what I should. But in fact, it no longer dwells in me, but sin dwells within me, for I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will that it is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. He's ranting here. Do you get this? He's not just saying it one time. He's saying over and over and over, why do I keep doing this? I love how God works. When, when we're done, everybody's going to have to take a look at Will's shirt. He was showing me his shirt a little bit ago, and I said, this is exactly what this is about. His shirt shows two gods standing, forcing humans to fight in front of them, okay? They're Greek gods. It's a 
sort of a joke, actually, but it's very true because what happens is we sometimes have God filling our light and filling our eyes and filling our mind and filling our heart. And by that, love. Oh, that person cut in front of me, they must be in a hurry. Oh, that person smoking next to a restaurant, well, it must be bad to have that sort of a problem that you can't quit smoking. Whatever it is. And then there are times and what happens is God is not in the house. <laughs> Your ego is in control. Ego stands for edging God out and God is gone. And inside you're ranting and raving at everybody and at yourself. So how do we change that part of us? How do we develop discipline. You know the word discipline means to be a disciple of yourself. That's what it means. It means to be a disciple of yourself. And unfortunately, so many of us are raised being told we need to be disciples of other people. Why? Because I said so. That's why. You probably heard that. You should do this because I said so, because I know better. When you're 19, you can make your own decisions. I actually know a person who can't understand why their child is so erratic and crazy. And look, what, what, why? Because she wants to do this and I tell her no. Well, why can't you let her make her own? When she's an adult, she can make her own decisions. That's like telling an infant, when I turn you out of the house, you can walk. Are you a disciple of yourself or are you a disciple of others? That means a follower. The word disciple means a follower. Are you following what society tells you you should do, how you should act, what you should look like, what you should believe, how you should parent, how you should live? Or are you asking yourself? It's so much easier to have discipline when you're doing what you want to do. And then there are those parts of us that are just habits. Paul is very self-disclosing. My habit is anger. In arguments, I get angry. It worked for me as a kid. I was a big, heavy-set kid. Now I'm a big, muscular man. I can scare about anybody. My ego knows that's a good way to win. Arguments, not a good way to win friends or relationships. So I work on it all the time, and I've gotten better. I take the three musketeers approach. See, when I was a kid, I was so heavy, and my mom was always putting me on these different grapefruit diets and egg diets and protein diets and whatever diets, which made me get heavier and heavier and heavier. I discovered that all of this starvation and telling me I was bad and fat made me have this in my mind. And so I would go through the canteen at the school and I would get a pack of crackers and a diet and a tab, which my mother told me was adequate for a 14-year-old boy for lunch. And I would sit there and I'd watch my friends eat who didn't have a weight problem. And then finally I would sit there and I would get nervous. I'd start to sweat as it got time to go back into class because I wanted something else to eat. And finally, once I'd made that decision, I'd go in and I'd, I'd just get a Three Musketeers bar. Then I'd loop back around and get a pizza. Then I'd loop back around and I'd get something else. And so finally I decided, no more Three Musketeers bar. And you know what I did the next day? I white knuckled it. This sounds stupid. Over a Three Musketeers bar. But the next day it was a little bit easier. And the next day it was a little bit easier. See, whenever we as people make a decision to improve our lives, we get rewarded. We get a ro rush of dopamine, which is the bliss drug, which makes us go, yeah, that's a great idea. But then the next day we're faced with doing it and our minds go, what the hell was I thinking? Because we're faced with actually doing it. 
And so what we do is we do it today and we do it tomorrow and we do it the day after. This is being disciplined. This is being a disciple of yourself. This is asking yourself, what is my highest and best good? And I'm going to do it a little bit every day. We think we can or should wave a magic wand and boom, we're totally different. It never happens that way. It doesn't work with weight loss, I'm here to tell you. And it doesn't work with changing our lives. Three years ago, I took Leah, my daughter, on what we call the obscure tour. We got in the car and we drove to some weird things. We went to the world's largest underwater lake, which is here in Missouri, which I later scuba dived. Um, we also went and saw in Indiana, the world's largest ball of paint. <laughs> Started by a man named Mike Alexander in 1979, he took a two and three quarter inch regulation Spalding baseball and he put one coat of paint on it which is one-tenth the width of a human hair. Every single day, he has added another coat of paint. When I went to see him three years ago, it was 52 inches across and weighed 3,500 pounds. That is nothing but infinitesimal layers of paint. Every day that you do something towards what it is you want to move towards, you're adding a layer of paint to it. Every day you don't, you're peeling a layer off. That's why it's so important that you and only you choose what's important to you so you can just keep adding those layers of paint. Marty and I went to... Uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not in San Francisco last year. She'd never been to one. And there was a Bible there that a man had hand copied meticulously. I heard a wow. Thank you. I did. Say, wow. Can you imagine? Between you and me and the ordination board, I've never fully read the entire Bible. I'm close. But I certainly have never sat down and copied the entire Bible. Do you know how long it took him to do it? 18 months. Do you know how many hours a day he had to do that? An hour. One hour a day for 18 months. Five minutes a day towards being a better parent. Multiply that together. Five minutes a day or 30 minutes a day towards meditating. How peaceful will you be? 20 minutes a day towards your greatest hobby. 30 minutes, an hour towards exercise. It's all cumulative. Yoga, life, everything is cumulative. Become a disciple to yourself. Do you know the difference between a disciple and an apostle? A disciple follows. The apostle is one who has been sent out. I'm sending you out. You walked in this morning as disciples. I'm giving you an upgrade. <laughs> I'm sending you out to discover what is important to you because you are your highest good and to live it a little bit more every day. That's all it takes. Grab somebody's hand. Let's close in prayer. Infinite loving presence, we acknowledge the truth that we are on a path, a journey. And we don't need to be beaten or whipped down this path. It's a path of joy. And so we open ourselves to the truth that is within us so that we can then follow our path and enjoy and experience the life we are meant to have and to have a beautiful and profound impact on the lives of others. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen.